Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is going to be focused on this gorgeous Sony TAN8550. This is a VFET power amplifier from Sony from the mid-70s. And this power amp was sent to me with this gorgeous TAE8450 that I just finished a restoration on. I actually just uploaded the video of this to my channel today. So when all said and done, these two are going to be living together. So this is going to need quite a comprehensive restoration. Um, not only is this going to be an electrical restoration, but this also sustained some shipping damage. You can see that the rear panel got um, bowed down pretty bad. If you look at it from the front on, you can see the whole back of the chassis is warped. Doesn't look to be too, too bad, but it did split the wood and it did push down this corner. This is really thick gauge steel, so this took a pretty big impact. Luckily, nothing else seems to be damaged on this. I haven't done a thorough inspection of the inside yet, so we'll get to that uh, pretty soon here. Um, I don't know if this works. I have to follow the steps in the service manual to test the VFETs and the related circuit to make sure everything is uh, working okay before I do any work on this. I just need to form some sort of baseline. So that's the best way to do that. But uh, I'll pop the top cover off and we can take a look inside. Somebody has been working on this thing before. Um, from what I see, one of these trimmers has been replaced. He has replaced, I think, all of the VD-1212s with 1N4148s. He's done a pretty, um, pretty sloppy job of the work that I see. So I'm going to have to change out everything that's been replaced already. I see new capacitors down in there. So... Um, I'm going to be replacing all capacitors. doesn't matter if they've been replaced yet or not. I just need to know that the capacitors that are in there when I finish are new and working properly. It's not good to assume anything. There's, uh, there's only a few boards in here, but I see a ton of components that are going to need to be replaced. Lots of diodes. You can see in this area right here, Lots of board discoloration, so those diodes get pretty hot, so I'm probably going to be changing those out. I think somewhere, yeah, right next to those diodes, you can see resistors that have gotten hot. Just, uh, yeah, replaced, replaced resistors, you know. So, somebody's been at this thing before. It looks like bare minimum work was done. Um, definitely not... Uh, a, a job that is uh, worthy of this amplifier. It's definitely going to need some uh, some TLC. There's some scratches on the faceplate, but I'm sure we can clean those up. They're pretty deep though, so we'll see. Um, the capacitor is a dual cap, so there's two 10,000 microfarads with a shared um, ground lug. And to replace this, I was also sent a hockey puck that has been bored out with two capacitors. I'm not sure how I feel about this. I do like the hockey puck idea. That's actually not a bad idea at all. And these are only 10,000 microfarads too. It seems pretty strange to me how Sony seems to have underspecced the filter capacitors in this amp. I'm gonna see if I can up the size a bit. Maybe I can get some taller caps with the same diameter to fit. Because I do, uh, I do wanna up the value. Because right now this is this is being shared between two channels, 10,000 each. So you only have 10,000 microfarad for your B plus and another 10 for your B minus shared between two channels. So that's, eh, that's not very good. You do have a very, very big transformer though. So you will make up for it in that, but uh, it won't hurt to add some more filter capacitance. Definitely not. Um, there's quite a few service boltons on this amp the last time I checked, um, one of which involves removing and replacing these connectors right here uh, in favor of a wire wrap because these connectors, you can see it's discolored and they become brittle and they fail over time. 
And if that were to happen, you risk blowing the VFETs up. So we're gonna have to sort that out. I'll take care of that later. But all these connectors on this amp board right here, these two amp boards, those have to go. So there's quite a bit of work. I will come back in the testing phase of the amplifier and we'll go from there. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely excited to work on this. It's definitely an earlier generation um, and I'm definitely interested to hear it. Um, it's definitely a very cool amp. So I have the 8550 up on its side and I have the shrouds removed from each channel so I can access all the VFETs. And I note that every VFET is from the same rank. These are all rank 56, which is very, very good news. That just means that nobody's messed with this before and they're not mixing and matching VFETs, which is a good thing. In the service manual, they note that you're not allowed to mix different ranks. They have a rank from 53 all the way up to 58, and that has to do with the cutoff voltage and the gate source voltage of each VFET. So like I said, it's good news that they're all the same. So I'm going to start removing them and testing them, making sure that there's none that are open or shorted. And then we're going to move over to the testing of the amplification stage based on the parameters that Sony gives us. Okay, I'm back with the 8550. I have all the VFETs removed, cleaned, and tested. I'm following along with the service manual where they have you remove some connectors from the boards and measure across uh, a few resistors just to verify that you have proper voltage. You can see right there. With the VFETs removed, with the pins removed, you should have 33.8 to 38.8 volts across those resistors, which we do. And that's basically identical to the other channel. And that voltage is adjustable with these potentiometers right here and right here. So that just shows the circuit is working. And uh, that basically means it's safe to put the VFETs in and you shouldn't have any issues. So I'm gonna put these VFETs back in temporarily. And what I'm gonna do is verify signal integrity and make sure there's no other issues with any other parts of the circuit. But uh, for now, it should be safe to reinstall these. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I'll come back with uh, some tests and maybe some measurements before I begin disassembly and work on this awesome amplifier. So I have the 8550 back on the bench. The last video I took, I was gonna put the VFETs back in and test the amp out, make sure it was passing signal, make sure the VFETs were happy. But uh, I stopped that video and I sat back down and I started to take another look at these two circuit boards here. And I realized that a lot of the components were drifting, especially these carbon comp resistors. There's a few resistors that are burnt. Somebody else has been working on this, these two circuit boards as well, as well as the power supply and these boards up front, which we'll get to in a second. But uh, given the context, somebody's been in here working, doing a really terrible job, uh, changing parts arbitrarily. What I'm gonna do is completely rework every board in this amplifier. Wherever this guy was, I don't care what he did, everything's being replaced. Resistors, transistors, capacitors, diodes, everything. We're gonna start from scratch. Um, because this amplifier uses VFETs, I don't feel like screwing around and risking uh, the circuit integrity um, because I missed one drifting resistor. So if I replace everything with the correct high quality parts, we will know that uh, the circuit is working and it's gonna keep working, nothing's gonna fail. Um, unless obviously somebody shorts the speaker outputs, but uh, that's beside the fact. I wanna make sure that this amp is able to work as well and as efficiently and um, reliably as it possibly can. So if I go in here and replace all these crappy film caps with high quality propylene, um, polypropylene caps, replace these really terrible carbon comp and carbon film cap uh, resistors with metal film resistors. And I get these trimmers out of here with some new high quality multi-turn trimmers. Remount these uh, TO66 devices after testing them and just completely reworking the board entirely. I, everything's gonna be replaced. I don't wanna have to come back in here uh, with my tail between my legs because VFETs blew up. So 
I'm just going to err on the side of caution. I'm already in here. I'm already going to be touching up every solder joint. One other thing I want to point out in the power supply is that there's been a high current fault. Don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but this regulator right here, which is a series pass regulator, is completely shorted. Base emitter and collector are shorted together. And that took out this little TO92 transistor right here and this one right here. Now, this regulator forms um, one of your main rails that goes up to your Class A differential amp right here. So if I were to plug this thing in and turn it on, um, nothing would have worked up front. Well, I wouldn't have got signal either way because this stage right here is faulty. Um, it wasn't pulling excess current when I had it on the current limiter and the variac, so that would explain that. So uh, things like this are why I'm going to just completely rebuild this amp. I will also point out the work that's been done, like I've said, it's really terrible. I don't even think somebody who works on refrigerators and microwaves and washing machines would, would oh solder like God, that. Bro. That's Hell really no, sad to see that a piece of equipment like this has fallen in the hands of a monkey, I guess is what I should say. If you call yourself a repair tech and claim to be working in people's best interest while charging them to do work like that, uh, you should be ashamed. You're an idiot. But uh, that's beside the point. That's going to be rectified. That's going to be taken care of. So I'm going to pull that board out next, make a parts count for that, and then uh, we will go from there. Okay, a couple days have passed since I took that last clip. Um, I've since placed an order for all the components I'm going to need on all these boards, all the way down to the resistors and all the semiconductors and film caps that you see here. Um, as I've said before, I have uh, the two new capacitors for this main filter block coming. I upped the size from 10,000 microfarad to 15, so that should be a pretty good increase in size. I have, like you see, I have this main front section removed, as well as the rest of the amp. I have it all laid out here. For the power supply, I also decided to order some new high-speed rectifier diodes to replace the original um, bridges right here. I'm going to leave these metal shrouds and cut these diodes out, drill some holes, and uh, mount the, do, the new diodes there. So you'll see that when I, uh, when I do that. It should be a, a pretty good uh, replacement for these higher current, higher speed diodes. New uh, regulators, I'm using MJs, which are much better for this application. They'll run a lot cooler. So I have lots to do. I just have to wait for the parts to come in. And uh, yeah, we will uh, keep going. And I'll bring you guys a update as soon as I get this board out here, get these removed, and get this rear panel off. I have to uh, straighten out a lot of these these panels as it took a pretty big impact during shipping. The owner is sending me some new wooden side panels for it that he has, as well as some other parts. Hopefully a, another faceplate, as this one is uh, has some damage on it. This corner right here is cracked and it has some nicks on it and scratches and gouges. So, but yeah, everything is, uh, is looking good. I was able to source all the parts I need. So good news so far. So like I said, I'll be back shortly. So in the power supply in the 8550, they're using a couple of Zener diodes as voltage references. And I want to show you just how worn out these components are. This one right here is only registering as like a three volt zener. This one right here is a bit better. It's measuring around nine, but uh, I wanna show you the zener voltage actually increases as the current goes up. So at two milliamps, we're sitting at 9.36 volts, which is a bit low, uh, with a slope resistance of 50 ohms, and that's very high. And if we increase the current, we can see the voltage goes up quite considerably. And of course, the slope resistance goes down. Now, if we take a new Zener diode, 10 volt Zener, we'll see that the Zener voltage or the breakdown voltage is actually pretty stable. So at 2 milliamps, we're sitting at about 10.2, uh, I'm sorry, 10.21. At 5 milliamps, sitting basically about the same, 10.21. All the way up to 15. It doesn't move that much. 
and you can see the slope resistance is basically nothing. It's like three ohms. So I'm gonna install these new zeners in circuit, but uh, yeah, 10 volt zener measuring at about three volts, that's not good. And the other one is drifting around quite a bit. So setting up proper reference voltages for your regulated power supplies is very important, um, especially in a circuit like this. So I'm still going along with the uh, rework process of the circuit board. And I just got to this capacitor right here. It's a Nichicom Muse. It's a 47 microfarad at 100 volt, 85C rated. Um, I don't like to use these in the power supplies of equipment. These aren't really designed for that. These are more of an audio capacitor. So uh, there's much better capacitors that are suited for power supply duty. So for replacement, I have a Nippon Chemicon or United Chemicon KYB series, 100 microfarad at 100 volt. Going up in value a little bit, um, but uh, yeah, this will be a good replacement. And uh, let's just take a look at the trace work. So after removing that capacitor, you can see that the last guy really uh, kind of butchered this trace up a bit. So I'm going to come in here and uh, clean this trace up a bit so I have more of an anchor point. Yeah, you can see this trace is actually just peeling off the board. So I'm gonna grab a razor blade and just cut the piece that's hanging off. Yeah, he really destroyed this trace here. The trace on the left is actually pretty okay. So it's just the one on the right that's pretty nasty. Okay, so I'll get this new one installed. And that's about all I can do in this case. Capacitor's solid now, so that's all that matters. So I just removed these other two capacitors here. And uh, I'm about as careful as you can get when it comes to removal and replacement of components. And uh, I honestly don't know what the last guy did here. It looks pretty terrible. Um, more lifted traces, and it's almost like there's a sort of glue that's just kind of smeared on the board here. I think that's actually exactly what it is. See that or his flux is just turned to like jelly. See that? Pretty terrible. This trace is lifted. This one I think is about to be lifted. Um, so I'm gonna have to go in here and scrub this crap off of here and uh, I'll be back as soon as I do that but yeah not good so I'm back after a couple days I uh, received the side panels from the owner as well as another faceplate 
This is the new faceplate that I received. You can see it's in a little bit better condition than the original. What I'm going to be doing is swapping these two back plates out as this original one that came with the amplifier is in a bit better condition than this one. You can see there's a couple nicks on this one. I'm also going to be swapping the lenses out. You can see this one's pretty dull. It's been polished before, not too well. And this one's in pretty good shape. So I'm going to take this one and put it on this plate. But uh, yeah, it's good to get these scratches uh, off of this amp, especially these ones on the top that are really noticeable. As well as this nick right here and this deep gouge. This face plate's in a lot better condition. So we'll get that all swapped out. Um, I'm also going to sand and refinish these uh, wood side panels. These are in better shape. Um, especially since the originals took a pretty big hit in shipping. So, but yeah, I don't know if I've shown this already. I have all the parts laid out for the amplifier modules. Um, I have a bunch of parts right here. These are mainly resistors here. I have the power supply just about done. I uh, forgot to order a specific value of resistor, so I'm just using these uh, cheaper metal films just for now for the testing phase. But um, power supply looks good. Every component on here has been replaced, obviously. I had another power supply shipped with this. Uh, with the rest of the, the stuff that I got in the second time around from the owner. This transformer arrived, and because the circuit board was packed in the same box, it uh, suffered quite a serious blow in shipping, and you could see it's pretty much destroyed. But this one was in worse shape. You could see somebody had worked on this before and pulled almost an entire trace up and bodged a wire on. So I wouldn't have used this either way but it's sad to see. So I'm going to start work on the chassis next. I'm going to try to straighten out the back side of it and uh, get some stuff going here. I haven't worked on this for a couple days. I've just been too busy, but I'm going to work on the chassis next, try to get this straightened out. Um, I might actually have the owner ship me a new rear plate. Uh, I'm sorry, top plate. I think he has another one of these just so I don't have to spend time bending that back. It's actually pretty thick gauge steel, so it'll be kind of difficult, but uh, I have access to a, a uh, sheet metal shop, so that won't be too difficult. But uh, yeah, when I have all this uh, together, including the power supply in, um, I think that's where I'll come back. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I got new capacitors for the filters. I went up in, uh, size from 10,000 to 15,000 and they're a lot longer but they'll they'll end up fitting I'm gonna have to make a copper bus bar um, instead of just the wire that was originally there which will turn out pretty nice but uh, yeah it's all coming along I'm making some progress slowly so when I'm all set with the chassis work and I get the power supply in and tested that's I think that's where I'll come back okay just another quick update here I have the chassis basically torn all the way down. I have the wiring loom removed as well as the transformer from the support bracket. You can see the transformer bolts here. And this is where the filter cap goes. Um, chassis is filthy, so I'm gonna be giving this a deep clean. I have the side panels off and the rear panel off as well. So this is all gonna look pretty good when I'm done with it. I also have to straighten this out. Shouldn't be too big of a deal. Um, and when I get back together, I'm going to verify that everything is straight um, and goes together uh, without any issue because I don't want to strip any screws or damage hardware trying to force shit together. So when I get to that point, I will take another video. Okay, I'm back with the 8550. It's been a few weeks since I've worked on this thing and taken video. Uh, the last videos that I took were basically rendered useless by the app that I'm using. Uh, during viewing while recording, the videos looked pretty okay. Uh, but when I played them back after I exported them, the videos were all shaky, and there's not really much I could do about that. So it basically rendered them useless. Um, so I'm just going to run you guys through what I did so far. I have the back panel completely done. Um, I'm kind of doing this in the reverse. I usually start from the front and work my way back 
But uh, considering I wanted to get a baseline on the power supply and wanted this entire section done, I decided to just strip the chassis down, uh, clean it, reinstall everything. And while I had it apart, I basically just polished the back, installed the new binding posts and the IEC inlet. And I also reworked the input board. So I polished the RCA jacks as per usual. I broke these two coupling switches down and cleaned them with the ultrasonic cleaner. Reflowed the board and I also installed some new film capacitors on the back for the coupling. The power supply is all set to go, except for a couple things. I uh, just need to remove this connector and solder all these wires individually, just to get rid of this connector. It's a service bolt that Sony wants to do for a lot of the, the VFED amps. So I'm gonna get that done. Um, I have the filter caps installed with the bypass films as well. The copper bus bar on the top came out pretty well. And uh, this thing's very solid in the chassis, so it's not going anywhere. So uh, it's coming along. There's a lot of work to do. I'm going to move over to the amplifier boards after I get the power supply all set. And uh, you've seen these before. I have all the parts here. So I'm going to get that squared away. And uh, after that, I will move to the front panel and get the, the Class A input amp done. And uh, we'll go from there. But uh, yeah, this thing is uh, kind of a basket case. It needs a lot of work. And uh, I'm just going through it pretty slowly. Like I said before, I don't have a lot of time to do this. So um, I just do what I can when I can. So uh, yeah, you can see all the parts here. And I'm not lying when I say this thing is getting everything replaced. So keep going. Hey everybody, I'm back with the 8550. Um, I left off where I was just about to start work on the main amp boards. So I have one of these boards completely done, um, mounted back onto the heatsink with the VFETs installed. I've, uh, I've tested this board out, everything works as it should. All my voltages are correct, the VFETs are happy. The back side of the board is uh, looking good. I had cleaned the uh, heat sinks and the ultrasonic cleaner. Those turned out really well. I have some silicone pads underneath the, the VFETs. So I'm using all Dale resistors on here. I have uh, all of the original poly caps, like these, replaced with polypropylene film and silver mica caps as well. Every single component on this board, minus the two drivers here, and uh, a few of these diodes that are in the ASO network have been replaced. New emitters as well. I'll show you the old components here. You can see the uh, connectors that they used on the board previously became brittle and they cracked. I mean, these just crack with the slightest pressure. So instead of uh, keeping these original terminals, which is what I was planning on doing, these, you know, they crack too, you know, very easily, and the plastic melts when you go to solder to it. So I thought the next best thing was to, like I said, order some new uh, screw terminals. I think that's the best way to go here. I don't want to solder wires on here. Uh, solder connection, the wires can get fatigued with very small movement, and they can eventually crack easily. With here, it's a mechanical connection, so it should be better long term. But yeah, this board came out really well. I'm very happy with it. And I'm gonna replicate what I did here onto this board down here. So you can see beforehand this board is a mess with flux and uh, nicotine staining and uh, a lot of bodge work. That's what you see on this board. I had to touch up a few areas on this circuit board where somebody previously had lifted traces so I have to deal with that on this board as well, just as I did on the power supply. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. Lots of stuff to change out. I found uh, a very high amount of out of tolerance components on this board, mainly the resistors, like these carbon cop resistors here. 
Um, on this circuit board down here, I actually also found a shorted transistor and I've already replaced it. It's this one right here. It's part of your ASO circuit right by this SCR here. So this, uh, this board wasn't working originally uh, when it came to me as this uh, transistor was shorted. I think this all has to do with a voltage spike that this thing saw. Um, that's why the regulator was dead, or I'm sorry, the regulator power supply. And that's why the class A differential amp is also busted as well. I'm gonna have to dig into that later. But I have all the parts here to rebuild the second amp board. And uh, that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you some of the steps that I take and some of the techniques as well. Yeah, this thing is uh, <clears throat> pretty easy to work on. The traces are, uh, are pretty nice. They don't lift easily. The last guy that, that did this looks like he was soldering with a uh, hot nail. So there's tons of good uh, tutorials and videos on YouTube and otherwise on how to solder properly uh, and, and desolder as well. I think desoldering causes the most amount of damage as people don't have the correct equipment for that. And that's where a lot of the damage occurs. So it's really sad to see equipment like this get uh, tortured and brutalized from uh, monkeys, so to speak, that just don't know what they're doing. So, I mean, even the most... Uh, sought after technicians on these forms like Audio Karma and Audio Gone. They do some of the worst work I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, so it's always good to, to know who you're giving your equipment to. Um, always ask to see the work and always ask for a second and third opinion as well. So with that being said, I'm going to move over to this board and I'll come back in a minute. So I'll start a work on the next amplifier board. I have a bunch of the resistors replaced already. I'm nowhere near close to done yet. I've only done a handful of resistors so far. I have all the resistors that I'm replacing um, inserted on this foam piece that I have here with a cutout of the service manual illustration of one of the boards. That way I can pick and place these resistors onto the circuit board a lot faster otherwise. Um, so all Dale resistors minus these uh, the emitter resistors here, I'm using uh, Noble resistors, current sense, exact replacements. So with these larger resistors here, you can see I have one replaced. This one right here, I'm going to pull out. These are large 2 watt resistors and I'm replacing them with Dale resistors here, 2 watt specification. And uh, I have this cool tool, this is from Alco. It's an old lead bending tool, but I can't fit these resistors on here. The cutout is not big enough. So I have a tool called the Pace Conform 1. And uh, this allows you to bend your leads um, according to the, the size, the lead spacing of the circuit board. So it's basically like a caliper here, where you just uh, set these two spikes into the circuit board holes screw this nut, this uh, set screw down, and that'll give you the lead spacing. So you could put your resistor right in there, or any axial leaded component that is, just like that. Bend your leads down. And that gets you the correct size. I have uh, another cool tool I've shown off before on the channel. It's uh, a lead forming tool. It's an Arum 554TX. And this allows you to kink the lead so it st stands the component up off the board like it was from the factory. You can see the kinks in each one of these leads. And this tool that I have basically does the same thing. So with the spacing correct and with the two kinks on the leads, this resistor will sit into the board at the correct spacing and uh, distance off of the board to dissipate the, uh, the heat a lot better. And all that's left is to uh, solder it down. Just like that. 
So to uh, to get components to to be straight and look neat, it's not magic. You just need to have the right tools and the right techniques to do it. So I'm going to keep going on this circuit board. I'll get uh, all these resistors replaced. I'm doing every single resistor on the board. And then I'll come back with a follow-up video. Okay, I'm back with the 8550 power amp board. I have all the resistors replaced on this board from the quarter watt resistors all the way up to the half watt and two watt droppers. So now that that's out of the way, I'm gonna move over to the other passive components, um, such as the capacitors and uh, also some semis as well. So I have the, uh, the larger signal transistors up here and all the diodes as well. You can see the back of the circuit board still hasn't been reworked yet. It's because almost everything's going to come off this board anyway. I do all that uh, rework at the end. So if I spin you guys around over here, you can see that I have the same cutout that I use for the resistors for the other components for the board. So all the capacitors, diodes, transistors, everything. And I have all my tools here on both sides. So let's get to it. Um, I already removed one capacitor, which is located right over here. And that's just a, I think that's a one nanofarad capacitor. And uh, I pulled off these old poly caps here. I'm not sure whether or not these are polyester, but I'm replacing them with new film caps. These are uh, polypropylene film. So let's get these installed. The, uh, the main comment that I got on my videos uh, has to do with the fact that I don't show enough of the work that I do. Um, it's pretty tough to show the work that I do as uh, I'm really busy and setting up the camera takes quite a while. And uh, the, the videos just become way too long. Um, I don't really necessarily like to break them into specific parts. I usually just like to do uh, one video at a time for each piece of equipment. I get a lot of comments that say that people don't mind the length, but I get almost the equal amount of comments that say the videos are too long as is. So I can't really please everybody. You can certainly try, which is what I've been trying to do. But uh, I think for this video, I'll rebuild this whole amp board here on camera. Next up we have a Ceramic cap, I'm going to be changing this out with a silver mica cap. And I think this is a 36 or a 38 picofarad ceramic cap here. And I'm changing it out with a silver mica cap. All the small picofarad range capacitors on this board I'm using silver mica for. Silver mica has a really good uh, temperature coefficient, so they don't drift too much with temperature. They are very stable, and they are precision, and they will last the entirety of the lifetime of the amplifier with no issues. Silver mica caps are really expensive, though, uh, relatively speaking. They're not expensive per se it's just for what they are you you do pay quite a bit of money for them i think uh if you were to buy these capacitors um one by one they're a few bucks a piece so it's definitely uh pretty expensive when it comes to passive components like that now there's another one here I'm using an, uh, an FR301 desoldering tool. This is one of my best investments in the hobby. It really allows me to get work done a lot faster and uh, mitigate board damage. I see a lot of people that uh, use solder braid or in some instances a tool such as this, which is a solder sucker. So what you do is you hold your soldering iron up to the circuit board which I'll do here. You press down on this tang right here. You hold the solder sucker up to the solder joint in question, heat the joint up with a soldering iron, and you press a button, 
and you can see that it doesn't really work too well. So you spend a lot of time on the solder joint with the soldering iron and that will raise the risk of lifting a trace. And that's one of the reasons why I don't use these. These, uh, I feel these are good for hobbyists that don't work on a lot of equipment. Maybe they don't want to spend the $200 or so it, it costs for the FR301. But uh, I, I really don't like these uh, much at all. And this is a, a solder pult. I think this is made by Edson. And uh, this is a really high quality one. There, there's a lot of cheap versions out there. And this is a really nice one. And I still don't use it. It's just not, uh, not really viable for working on equipment like this. Too much uh, time spent on the solder joint itself versus the FR301, like I said. And you don't always get all the solder removed. So especially if you have a multi-layer board where you need all of the solder to be taken out of not only just the surface, but the layers between the printed circuit board, those really don't work. So let's install this new capacitor here. And the soldering iron I'm using is a Hakko FX951. It's uh, another great investment. Moving to the direct heated tip versus the old FX888D that I had that had a sleeve um, and the, so the heating element toward the, the base right down here. Having the heating element at the tip is uh, it's really, it's really nice to have. Spend way less time on solder joints and you can uh, heat soak larger thermal masses a lot, a lot faster. I also got a, a lot of comments about the hand tools that I use. I might actually make a video specifically for the hand tools that I have, but you can see I have a quite a lot of arum tools for different applications such as end strippers here, um, angled flush cutters, side strippers. I mean you name it, I probably have it from Aram. They're uh, very pricey but you can usually get them for a really good deal on eBay and they just come in handy. They make the uh, the final 1% of the fit and finish of jobs that much easier. I find that using cheaper hand tools with poor tolerances actually make the job harder in some instances. So that and having good tweezers is also a, a must for a hobby such as electronics work. It really, uh, like I said, makes things a lot easier. And they're just nice to use. You know, you pick up a pair of Arums and it's like, they feel really good. There's no spring that's hanging out that can fall off. The spring is located internally for most Arum tools. The grips are big. So, uh, yeah, I, I really can't recommend Arum tools enough. So we have those two capacitors done. That one's replaced as well. So let's get this trimmer out. See how fast that is with the F, uh, FR301? That quick, and you have components out. So I'm trying out this new tripod that I uh, 
got recently for my uh, mirrorless camera. I have a mount for my iPhone and uh, a microphone mount on the top, which is what I'm using. And uh, it's working pretty well. It, I'm working around the camera right now. I have the tripod in front of my bench, so I have to stand up. But uh, I think the, the quality is pretty nice. It's not as nice as some people that have the, the cameras facing down from the ceiling on their bench, such as uh, 12 volt vids. He has a really nice camera set up. So now the trimmer's replaced. Let's get these, uh, these old VD1221 replacements out. Somebody has worked on this before, as I've stated. And uh, they replaced the VD1221s, which is a good thing, but uh, I'm just gonna replace these anyway. Don't know what uh, manufacturer these are. So it's good to just get these out and uh, put new on semis in. I already have them fabricated here. My hand looks super pink under this light. I don't know why. See if it'll focus on that. You get the idea. So the VD twelve twenty ones, they're a uh, a dipped. Uh, dual package diode that are known to fail. They're usually used in bias circuits in older amplifiers and when they go bad the chance of your amplifier blowing up is pretty high. They're used in critical areas in the circuit and if they fail then the the bias tends to run away and you'll have a thermal runaway. So replacing them with uh, two 1N4148s in series is the standard way to go. I know there are going to be some people that ask me why I'm replacing all of the components on these boards. I think I might have already gotten into it before, so I'll be pretty brief. I don't know the history of these amps. Uh, I'm sorry, this amp. It came to me not working and has had other people work on it before. There's a lot of bad repairs. There's a lot of out-of-tolerance components and blown components. So I believe because of the obscurity and the rareness of these amps and the unobtainium outputs, the VFETs, I believe that uh, replacing everything with brand new components is definitely the way to go. The last thing I want is to have a out of tolerance resistor or an open resistor or a shorter transistor in here somewhere that I missed and power this amplifier up and have VFETs blow up. That's the last thing I want to do. So like I said, for the fifth time, replacing everything. And I know I still get I will still get comments asking me why, because, you know, a lot of people don't watch the full video. But, uh, it is what it is. This video is already 13 minutes long. I've gotten, like, four components replaced. This is why I really don't show what I'm doing on video too much. Because I talk way too much, get distracted. And next thing you know, the video is 30 minutes long, and I have done nothing. This is a little diode. Just a small signal diode that will get replaced with a <clears throat> another 1N4148. Just like that. So I like that lead bending tool, makes the job a lot easier. Makes the component sit in the circuit board nice and clean. Like that. A 
a lot of people will just toss it in there and solder it in haphazardly. And uh, it's not really something I like to do. I like to make the job look as neat as I can. Because the final product speaks for itself. I'll show it one more time, but this is the board that I have complete. And uh, all the components are straight. It's all neat. It looks fantastic. So. But yeah, I might do a, a video on the hand tools that I use. I have a lot of tools on this bench in this uh, toolbox right here. I mean, I have tons of stuff. So, I mean, just this drawer alone has a lot of the tools that I use on a regular basis, such as these OK Industries wire wrap tools. I also have a lot of chemicals on the top brushes, component testers. So I think some people might find that interesting enough to make a video out of it. I use a uh, Kester 6040 solder, rosin core. I've always used it. I've never used uh, any other types really, except for some of my Cardis solder which I use on binding posts and RC Ajax. It's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, quad eutectic. So it flows a lot easier on larger surfaces and it dries a lot faster. So you get uh, less likelihood of a dry solder joint. whack the camera while I'm at it. Here's another one. And that's the last of the uh, VD-1212s on this board, or 1221s, I think. There's three of them. Don't want to get these in backwards. Now, after I'm done installing all these components, I go back, I trim all the leads, and I touch up every single solder joint again. That way I cover the exposed leads that I get after cutting the excess off. So we're getting close to being done with the front side of the board here. We've got the resistors done, capacitors, so now we have to do these transistors up front. So I'm replacing these 2SC1124s with some TO26 packages that I have. The nomenclature is slipping my mind right now. I think they are Toshiba's, Toshiba devices. So 2SA835. Is going to be replaced with A004B. I think these are Toshiba or Fairchild. I'm not sure. Now, the one thing, if you're doing one of these amps, that you have to be careful about is the fact that these pinouts are different. Okay, so I have a cheat sheet here. So the 1124 is emitter, base, collector in that order, and the KSC 2690A is emitter, collector, base. Same thing with the 2SA835, it's emitter, base, collector, 
and the KSA 1220A is going to be emitter collector base. So you got to watch out the pins on these devices is different. So with that being said, with that transistor being removed, I'm going to have to install it so that it's sideways. Now, Sony made these pinouts triangular, so you don't really have to twist the pin so much as you have to rotate the transistor in the socket itself or in the in the circuit board, I mean. So the holes in the circuit board are too small for these pins to fit in. So another thing that I use on a daily basis when working on gear is a pin vise. It's just a small hand drill. You can get these anywhere, really. I use a very small drill bit. And there's a very small chuck at the front. You just stick your drill bit in there. And you can enlarge circuit board traces like this. Now what you want to do is go from the go from the trace side so you don't end up lifting a trace. So now transistor will fit in there without any issue. Just like that. So it's been uh, kind of hectic recently. I haven't really been working on audio gear too much. I've uh, really been working on it on and off. So it's been uh, since the past couple of days. Before that, it's been about a month since I've been able to work on this Sony amp. It's uh, unfortunate, but... I have a life outside of the audio hobby. I have work outside of the audio hobby. And, uh, okay, I'm not really sure what happened there. I, uh, looked down and my camera was off. So, uh, I got a few components replaced since the video last cut off. Um, so let's keep going with these capacitors here. <laughs> I left off when I was talking about uh, my schedule and how busy I've been. Um, don't have a lot of time for hi-fi repair. It's uh, it's really just nights and weekends at this point, and even then, um, sometimes I don't even get to it at those times. So uh, replacing these old poly caps with some new polypropylene films. Pretty much the standard cap that I use. Can't go wrong with Wema. They're really high quality. They're a bit pricey though, especially as you get up in the uh, capacitance and voltage ranges, but uh, I find they're worth it. So back onto the tripod topic, one of the other comments I get all the time is the fact that uh, 
my videos are often too shaky. It's because I use a handheld tripod, which is this right here. I can use it as a kind of a stand mount, which doesn't really work too well. So what I do is I end up just holding it like that. And I have my phone camera sitting on the top. Now I still prefer to do that, um, but having a tripod like this is nice. Um, it'll also cut down on the comments that I get from people who complain about uh, the motion sickness they get from watching my videos. And usually I try to keep my motion to a minimum uh, in terms of shakiness, but uh, you, like I said before, you can't please everybody. It's just the way it is, you know? I mean, some people are really dramatic about it. Some people say they can't even watch my videos because of the motion. So, figure setting the camera up on a tripod for a little while won't hurt. I recently got a uh, ultrasonic cleaner, and that's what I use to clean these heat, heat sinks off. And it actually did a really good job. Even uh, between the fins where you can't usually clean, it got really deep down into there and uh, got all the oxidation off. It really cleaned it up really well. This used to be like a, a really dark gray, uh, dirty with fingerprints on it and dust and nicotine and grease. And uh, now it looks brand new. That was after maybe five minutes in the ultrasonic cleaner. So I'm really happy with that. Yeah, I don't know why my video cut off there. That was a bit weird. I think it might hit the uh, hit the time limit. Just gonna have to pay attention to that next time. All right gotten pretty far basically the whole front side of the board is all situated I'm gonna save these uh, smaller TO 92 series transistors for off-camera because I have to really pay close attention to the the pinout on those I think what I'm going to do is replace these next two diodes and then I will cut the video there and I'll come back when I'm further along. I think that last clip that I just took was over 30 minutes long. So while longer videos are nice, it, uh, it does take a lot longer to edit and to upload and process the video. But people do seem to like it. I myself do like longer videos. Um, but longer videos also mean lower engagement and lower audience retention. And if any, if you guys know how the algorithm works, you know that the watch time and the retention really matter in terms of how often the video gets recommended. Now, I don't do this channel for mon uh, for monetary reasons. I don't, you know, make a lot of money on this channel. I don't do this for that reason. I do this because I enjoy doing it and I like sharing what I do. But it does give incentive to post more when you get more viewers, if that makes sense. More people see it, more people enjoy it. Therefore, I get more enjoyment out of it. 
But uh, even if I only had a few viewers, I would still post these videos. But uh, like I said, the more viewers, the more incentive. So longer videos aren't really the best for all that. The attention span of people nowadays doesn't really mix well with longer videos. Unfortunately, but that's just how it is. If you guys are looking for different channels to to view that do the same sort of work, if you haven't already checked out people like X-Ray Tony B, he does fantastic work. He posts videos regularly. And he also gets into the nitty gritty, which is something I really don't have time for on video in terms of circuit topology, circuit theory. Um, he gets into a lot of the troubleshooting, walking people step by step. So if you, uh, if you like that sort of content and that sort of video uh, style, then I suggest checking out uh, his channel. He does really good work. Again, it's uh, X-Ray Tony B. Um, a few other people, Ben Hayes from Novalux Stereophonic, he does a really good job uh, with his videos. He has a really nice lab. Who else? I mean, there's there's a lot of people online that do this sort of work. I'm not the only one. And uh, I usually feel my videos are a little bit uh, a little bit too rushed, maybe. So I'm going to install this new triac in a place. It still says I'm recording, so hopefully it uh, it actually still is. So I think I'm going to end it right there. You know what? I'll change this last cap out right in the center. So the guy that uh, did the work on this previously, he used uh, these Elna Silmic caps. These are actually really nice caps, but there's a time and uh, a place for these and in power supplies and uh, areas on this board where these are used, I wouldn't really suggest these. These are more of a signal path sort of cap. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think these are only 85C. Yeah, 85C rated. So I like to put in 105C rated uh, special power supply caps and, you know, high reliability caps. So this is a, this is a United Chemicon capacitor from the LXY series. This is a, a great fit for uh, the purposes that these capacitors on this board are used uh, for. High life, high temperature, low ESR, low leakage. Um, these are some of the best capacitors I've, I've found. You can also use Panasonic and Nichicon. Um, I completely stay away from capacitors like Rubicon and Jamicon. Rubicon does make some nice capacitors, but I find that uh, for the price of those, you might as well just go for Panasonic or United Chemicon or Nichicon. I mean, you can't go wrong with any of those. Those are high quality Japanese uh, tried and true in every sense of the word. So I'm going to keep going on this board and I will come back when I'm basically done. I think I'll show the deflux process again. I, I It's another comment I get uh, people asking me how I deflux boards. So I will come back when I get to that point and uh, we'll go from there. But so far so good. Okay so I have the 8550 board here that I just finished reworking. So I have all the new components installed and I have all the solder joints reflowed. Right now you can see the board is uh, pretty nasty. It has a pretty thick layer of flux on it. I have the two driver transistors removed. I'm going to install those after I do the deflux process that I'm going to show you guys in a second. So I have a, uh, a jar of 
used alcohol here. I've used this on a few other circuit boards so far. Um, I tend to use this until uh, it becomes too diluted, but uh, because alcohol is pretty expensive uh, for what you get, I do like to reuse it. And then I'll go ahead and refill that jar with some from this container right here. This is 99% isopropyl. So I, uh, I put the circuit board inside of a container like this. It's just uh, like some Tupperware. And I will pour some alcohol on the circuit board. Just like that. And uh, it's usually good to prop the container up so it'll all pool at the bottom. But uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. You just want to clean the circuit board off. I use a uh, stiff bristle brush. You could use a toothbrush or a, or a paintbrush or anything really. And uh, I'll be here for the next five or ten minutes removing all this old flux just like this until every last bit is done or, you know, removed from the circuit board. So I'll speed this up or I'll, uh, I'll do a jump cut to when I'm ready to do the next step. Okay, so I just got finished scrubbing the circuit board and I just dumped the alcohol back into that mason jar. And uh, what I'm going to do is just spray some new alcohol on the circuit board. That way I get all the residue off that was left over from the, uh, the reused alcohol. This way there won't be any residue left on the circuit board when it dries. So there's a few different ways you can dry these. You could dry them off with a microfiber cloth. You could let them air dry. Or you could uh, spray them with compressed air. Um, I have an electric compressor that I'll, that I'll use on this thing. And uh, that'll get everything off. And then you can uh, even go as far as to bake the circuit board in front of a heat gun or something. Or just let it air dry for uh, a day. That way you get everything off. But uh, I'll come back when I do that and we'll see the finished product. I forgot to mention that uh, if you use a plastic scraping tool, you can get the, uh, the heavier baked on flux off as well. That's uh, tough to get off of the circuit board that's uh, usually between the traces. So just another tip. Okay, so I have the uh, circuit board all set to go. It's all dried off. And you can see the back side is uh, nice and shiny. And right now I'm just getting these drivers reinstalled onto their heat sinks. And uh, I'm going to solder them back onto the board. So I uh, figured I'd uh, fumble in front of the camera and get one of these mounted. I'm just using some uh, silicone heat sink compound on these, which I apply with a toothpick. I find that's the easiest way to do that. I see people using uh, Q-tips, but uh, like uh, toothpicks are probably the better way to go here. Now with a uh, heat sink compound, you don't want a lot of this. You just want enough to uh, just cover the surface. You want to still be able to see the uh, the metal behind it for the most part. So like that, that's a pretty good uh, thin amount there. And no matter how careful you are, you're going to make a mess. It's just how it is. Doing this in front of the camera is actually pretty tricky. So 
So the uh, the screws go in from the bottom, and the screws that have the contact points for the collector, they use a uh, a star washer to lock it down. And then uh, both nuts on the top, they also use a star washer under each, just like that. It's kind of tricky to work in between these heat sinks. I'm using these uh, really nice old Exolite nut drivers. These things come in handy quite a bit. You don't want to uh, tighten those down too much. You just want to uh, snug them so you have good thermal interface between the transistor and the heat sink and so that you have a good contact point for the collector voltage to pick up through the screw. And just like that, this board's all set. All right, so here's the uh, complete amp board. I'm gonna get this uh, installed into the amp, sands the VFETs, and then we'll uh, measure voltages. And then if all looks good, we'll get the VFETs installed, and we'll go from there. I uh, took the terminals off, and I uh, dunked those in the ultrasonic cleaner to uh, clean them up, and they look pretty good. But uh, yeah, happy with how this board came out. It's identical to the, uh, the other amp board that I have in there now. And, uh, yeah, looks good. Got the new uh, Phoenix terminals on there. They look really good. So I'll come back when I have this board installed into the amp, and uh, we'll go from there. So I just got done testing the amp board in the 8550 and everything seems to be working well. So I've since moved over to the front board here. This is the differential amplifier as well as your power supply for your front light for the VU meter. Um, this board is going to get the same treatment. And before I start work on it, you can see just how dirty this is. Somebody sprayed some contact cleaner in here and the whole board is just covered in this nasty oil that has attracted uh, dust over time. So I'm going to clean this board off in the ultrasonic cleaner and get it clean uh, so I can start work on it. But uh, yeah, this thing's pretty filthy. I mean, everywhere I look, there's just this thick layer of uh, grease all over it from people servicing these potentiometers with uh, what appears to be like motor oil. I've seen some technicians use oil on potentiometers before, and uh, it's a pretty terrible thing to do. So uh, I'll be back when this board is all cleaned up, and we'll start the, uh, the rework process on it. I have all the uh, resistors here that I'm going to be installing. So I'll come back when I get to that point and I'll show you what the board looks like. I mean, even on the bottom side, you can see all the oil down here and things like uh, this regulator. It's just not even uh, coupled to the heatsink or to the board where it picks up the collector voltage. So, pretty bad. I have one of the trimmers from that board here. Um, one way you can clean these is you could just spray some deoxid into the top of that uh, hole right there. But uh, if I'm going through all this effort, I might as well open one of these up. Figured I'd do one on camera just to show you. They're pretty simple. Just four tabs that you have to lift and this whole body will come off and leave you with the carbon track and the two fingers for the contacts. So what I like to do is spray some uh, contact cleaner on a Q-tip. And then I'll just go in here and I'll clean off the excess buildup from the carbon tracks. I 
And you can see it's pretty dirty. You don't want to be too aggressive or use anything uh, too harsh on the uh, carbon. Otherwise, you'll lift it right off of the substrate. Yeah, you can see just how nasty it is. I'm trying to keep this on camera for you guys. So after you clean all the excess dirt and grease off of the contacts, you apply some Deoxid D100L. Just a small amount. You don't want a lot. You just uh, apply it right to that area right there and spin this around a few times. And then uh, you're done. You can just put this right back into its case and bend these ears back. And just like that, good as new. So I'm back with the, uh, the front board here. I just took this out of the ultrasonic cleaner and I dried it off. I took the, uh, the pots off and I took uh, a couple of the other components like this uh, TO66 regulator here. But uh, two things that I forgot to remove were these two JFETs on the input. Now, when you run a circuit board like this in the ultrasonic cleaner, you will run the risk of having the silk screen removed from the components which in this case, it's not a big deal because I'm replacing all these semiconductors anyway. I'm replacing everything on this board. Um, but these two input differentials that I left in um, by accident, the silk screening has come off of them a little bit on the one on the left, but the one on the right has it almost completely removed. If you hold it into the light just right, you can make out what it says. Uh, it's funny that one was affected and one wasn't uh, as bad. But uh, that's just something to stay aware of. I normally would have removed these, but it just slipped my mind. So just a superficial issue. I'm not too concerned about it. But uh, if you look at the circuit board, you could see that it's nice and clean now. I mean, this was only in there for about 60 seconds, and it took off everything. All that residue and grease and dirt and oil, it's now gone. So uh, it's a good baseline to start now. Well, I'm going to move over to... Uh, installing these resistors onto the board. I'll get these done and then I'll come back when I do that. I figured I'd just get these out of the way because they're pretty mundane and uh, I think I'll actually stream that uh, on my channel. That'll probably take a little while so I'll make a stream out of it. So after I do this I will come back and we'll start populating the board with uh, other components. The uh, semis, capacitors, trimmers, all sorts of stuff. But uh, these two trimmers are done. I'll get those reinstalled. And uh, I'll get this TO66 cleaned up with the heat sink and I'll apply some new thermal paste and get that installed as well. One thing I noticed was uh, they had a, a Nichicon Muse capacitor. This is like an audio grade cap. And they had it right here in the uh, regulated supply for the, uh, the lamp on the front panel, which is pretty funny. Um, it's totally overkill. Not something I would have used, but uh, I don't know. That's what happens when people that don't really necessarily know what they're doing start just shotgunning components and putting caps in. They think that a muse cap in a, in a light circuit will make the amp sound better. So whatever, it doesn't hurt, but there are better options. Okay, I'm back with the uh, front board here. I left off a few days ago and I had just replaced all the resistors on the front here. So you can see all of these old carbon film resistors have been replaced with these nice Dale uh, metal film resistors. 
I also have a bunch of the old transistors removed, uh, mainly these larger uh, transistors here that I replaced with uh, TO126s. So I'm gonna continue on uh, replacing components on this board. Starting from the right, we have a couple transistors on the input. And I'm just gonna show you real quick that uh, these two transistors are shorted. So I have my multimeter hooked up and when these two probes short together, you can hear that the uh, continuity buzzer goes off. So I'm gonna go from emitter to base on these two transistors. Right on the input. They are shorted. And they measure shorted out of circuit as well. So those two transistors right there are on the input of the amplifier. And they're part of a protection circuit that measures temperature and I think DC offset. I've uh, been studying this schematic a little bit. And uh, these two transistors are also uh, related to the power supply and the fault that we had, where we had uh, some transistors that shorted out. So I'm not entirely sure what caused this. I think it could have been uh, a DC transient on the input. That's what the owner said might have happened um, when this amplifier stopped working. So um, I'm going to get these two replaced, uh, finish the rest of the board, make sure I don't have any other components that are bad, and then uh, we're going to go from there. But uh, I think these two transistors were the majority of the cause of the symptoms of this amplifier. So with that being said, I'm going to get them removed. So technically this amplifier can run without these in place, but considering they're part of a protection circuit, I am going to leave these in. These just clamp your input signal. So I'm going to change these out with a couple of, what are these, uh, 1015s right here. So these have the same pinout as the original. They're just a uh, drop-in replacement. So I'm having uh, less time to work on equipment than usual. Uh, it's the holidays right now. Christmas is in a few days, so I've been pretty busy with that. So I haven't really had a lot of time to uh, work on this equipment. I know I always say that, but I have less time than usual now. But uh, after the holidays, I will have quite a bit more time to uh, allocate to this. I'd like to get this uh, amplifier done within the next week or so. I'm uh, right at the final stretch here. It's just this front circuit board. And then uh, get this reinstalled. And then we're going to move on to uh, testing everything. Um, and then we'll move to cosmetics, which is going to be the last step. But it's going to be pretty tricky, as this did suffer. Uh, some shipping damage. And this is kind of a pain in the ass to uh, to get on video. I mean, every time I look at the camera, it seems like I'm out of frame. But uh, people seem to like the uh, tripod. It's my first time really using one like this. It's one of the main comments I get from people saying that I should uh, get a tripod. So I actually did do a stream on this. If you look back on my channel, you might be able to find it. 
where I was uh, talking with a buddy of mine and uh, replacing these uh, resistors on the board. And that stream on on for uh, over an hour. I think it's closer to uh, two hours. So got those two uh, capacitors replaced. Let's move over to these transistors here. <clears throat> these are uh, 2SC 926A typical Sony style so I didn't realize but the video cut off there um, I'm using a USB microphone for my phone and uh, when the cable disconnects, it actually shuts the video off and it doesn't really give me any indication of that. So I just kept going and didn't realize the uh, camera wasn't recording. So I just ordered another cable, so hopefully this one will last throughout the video. Um, I got a, a bunch of the transistors replaced on here up front. I got these two trimmers done. I have this capacitor replaced as well. So uh, I'm just going to keep going here. Hopefully I don't knock the camera and cause the... Uh, the microphone to disconnect again. So this is the one of the Zener diodes right here in the TO92 package. So let's just measure this. So it's uh, 7.617 volts. Now let's compare that to the uh, Atlas Xana that I have. So red is anode. Okay, so on the uh, Atlas Xana it's measuring 7.57 uh, volts. And this is a, I don't know if you can see it. This is a 47 designation. So 1T243. And then the bottom number there says uh, 3247. The first two digits are just a batch code, but the last two digits uh, are your uh, indication for your Zener voltage. So 47 uh, should be a 7.5 volt Zener. So we're measuring about 7.5. Yeah, it drifts with uh, current. Yeah, that's not good. Yep, so this has the same issues as the other ones. It, it drifts around as you increase the current. So I have a replacement Zener here. This one right here is a TZX Zener. So let's get this on the Atlas and let's uh, take a look. So you can see this one's a 7.5 and this one won't change too much as I increase the current. So this is a much better uh, diode, better condition. So let's get this one installed. And because it's a Zener, I'm going to sit it up off the board a little bit. Let's get this installed correctly. Yeah, I'm sorry the video keeps cutting off. It's not really much I can do about it. It's just one of those things. I'm gonna get a, uh, a new cable for it 
and uh, hopefully that'll help. But in the meantime, like I said, hopefully this uh, cable that I'm using will, will last at least a little while longer. All right, so that Zener is installed. So basically everything on this side of the board is, is all set to go. I'm going to move over to these two capacitors here. Now I'm replacing um, the ceramic caps with silver mica, as I've said. It's kind of overkill to uh, use silver mica caps, but uh, Considering we're going all out on this amp, I figured it's worth it. Okay, so now that those are all set to go, let's get this electrolytic out of there. Now, they did use uh, good quality electrolytic caps. These are all um, Elna caps, but I'm doing everything anyway. So getting these out of there and getting known good capacitors installed, I think is worth it. And for these larger ceramic caps, I'm just going to use some uh, Wema polypropylene caps in their place. Okay, so let's get these other caps changed out. I had accidentally put a 35-volt uh, cap in place of a 50-volt, so I just got that changed back out for the uh, correct value. So this one's a uh, another 4.7 at 50. That's why it's always good to uh, double-check your work, no matter what you're doing, because you will find mistakes that you've made along the way. No matter how much experience people have, doesn't matter. You're always going to be making mistakes, no matter how hard you uh, try not to. It's just the name of the game. Nobody's perfect, you know. The people that claim otherwise are the ones that don't seem to have the most experience. Or 
or any experience at all for that matter. Everybody's human. And when you're doing a restoration like this on an amp and you're changing everything out, really, really pays off to uh, double and triple check your work. Because you don't want uh, things going south. I'd like to say that I have quite a bit of experience, but uh, I have nowhere there near the amount as a lot of other people do. But uh, I usually am pretty good about uh, the work that I do, or I try to be anyway. So now that those are out, I'm going to move back over here and swap out these diodes that I forgot to take out. Tell you what, the uh, FR301 is a great tool. Even if you don't do a lot of this work, it really pays for itself tenfold. I mean, I don't know what I'd do without it. So the diodes that I'm removing are uh, 1S1 triple fives. These are really common as dirt in this old Sansui gear and old Sony gear. So to change these out, all I'm using is some um, 1N4148s. These will work really well in their place. These are just a direct replacement for those. Really just a generic small signal diode. Simple as that. Okay, so with those replaced, I'm gonna move over further to the left. Let's get this bigger cap installed. This is a 1,000 microfarad at 35. This is the one that they had the uh, large Muse capacitor in there. So this one's gonna be smaller, which will allow better cooling around this uh, rectifier here and around this uh, transistor. Let's get this uh, rectifier bridge taken out. So I'm pulling out uh, 10D-2 diodes. These are pretty standard rectifier diodes. They're only about one amp or so. So not very high current. And you can see on the circuit board, they've been getting pretty hot. See the discoloration down here. So to uh, replace them, I'm gonna be using a uh, couple pairs of 1N5402s. These are three amp rectifier diodes. So these are gonna be running a lot cooler um, and a lot more reliably in the place of the originals. So let's get these installed. I'm gonna be spacing these ones up from the board as well. Just trying to find my lead spacing here. Looks to be about a 7 16 lead spacing. So I will have to drill the circuit board out for this. 
That's why I love having a, a pin vise. So I got the holes drilled in the circuit board. I have my diodes all set to go here. Lead spacing should be pretty accurate. Just gotta drop them right in. like that. Kind of a pain in the ass because the leads are so thick on these ones. So here's the rectifier installed. Now that that's done, I'm going to get this trimmer out. This is a 2.2K uh, trimmer. This is used for the, uh, the front light for the view meters. It's to dim it to get the best focus. So I'm going to drop in a, uh, a nice Borns trimmer to replace that. Not totally necessary, but I'm in here anyway. Might as well get it changed out. I'm sure the other trimmer was perfectly fine, but like I said, we're in here anyway. No harm in replacing it. It's another dollar added to the rebuild cost, so pretty negligible. All right, now that that's done, I'm gonna get this diode down here changed out. This is the uh, the other Zener diode on this board. This is in the uh, same supply for that light. It's pretty funny how uh, how far Sony went just to create a power supply for this little lamp on the front. The Zener diode here. You could just about see the two digits on the bottom are 49. So that is a 10.1 volt designation. Don't ask me why. So I have another Zener here that I'm going to use to replace that. Just like that. So you can see this uh, board designation has this labeled as a transistor here. We flip it on the back side, you can see that they never had a, uh, a center pin solder to it. So that's a, uh, a mistake. They even call it a, a diode here, D307. 
So it's an interesting uh, screw up on Sony's part. It's one of the only mistakes I've seen on the silk screening. And then I'll just clean it up. A pair of tweezers. Yeah, so I took another look at it and I uh, decided to take the Zener diode back out and install um, a couple of the ceramic standoffs that I have. That way the leads won't touch each other because the spacing is so small between the two. Um, and when I took it out, I had to straighten the leads back out. So I used a pretty cool tool that I have. This is a, an Arum 531. This is a set of lead uh, forming pliers that I have. They have a plastic jaw and that allows you to uh, straighten leads out without damage. So I'll give you an example here. What you do is you just put the lead in and you twist it and spin. And that way your uh, lead comes out straight and you don't damage the, uh, the actual lead material itself. These jaws are replaceable. So uh, yeah, it's a handy tool. I use it once in a while, but it's insanely expensive for a pair of these. I think this is like a $200 tool or something like that. But I got this on eBay for pretty cheap. I think I paid like 20 bucks for it, new in box. So it always helps out to have, you know, small tools like this. It just helps, helps you do the job and uh, makes the final results that much better. But now that that's done, I'm gonna move on to uh, the last few components on this board. So here's the board all finalized. I have it reinstalled into the uh, front plate here. I got the back all cleaned up. Looks really good. All new components, so just about done. I want to show you guys a uh, just some information I found out. So if you look at these screws on a lot of this old Japanese equipment, you'll see right here that there's a little dot on the head of the screw. And that dot is there on every single JIS screw that you'll find. JIS is uh, Japanese Industrial Standard. And these screws were used in uh, all of this old Japanese equipment. If you go and look at your receiver, your amplifier right now, I'm sure you're going to have uh, a few of these at least on there if you have old equipment. So right here I have a uh, just a regular Phillips number two screwdriver. This is a new one uh, from Weira. If I zoom in, you can see that with this screwdriver in the screw, you can see it. there's quite a bit of movement there before the screw is able to turn. I show you this screwdriver. This is a vessel. This is a JIS screwdriver. I'll show you what this one looks like. You can see there's a lot less movement there. So um, I used to think that all these screws were actually Phillips, but they're not. They're JIS. So if you go to use a uh, Phillips screwdriver on these and it's tightened down quite a bit, you might end up stripping the screw if you don't have the correct driver for it. So I thought I'd just share that with you guys. It's an interesting thing that I recently found out. But uh, this board is all set to go. I'm going to move over to the last circuit board here. I have a uh, speaker selector switch and uh, a few other switches on here as well. It's had some pretty janky work done. Somebody soldered uh, the front lamp wires oh down. God, did, did a pretty crummy hey, job at it. And uh, upon removing the circuit board, I'll show you. Um, it appears as if one of the arms for this rotary switch has fallen off. 
I'll grab it and try not to lose it. You can see it right there. That's one of the uh, the tangs for this uh, rotary switch here. Now, I took a really close look at this rotary switch. I do not see anywhere that it fell off. These two switches right here are identical, and this switch right here is on its own, and there is zero place where this arm could have fallen off. I don't see a missing arm anywhere. So it could be that this arm was just sitting in the amp from the time it was manufactured, or maybe I'm missing something. But uh, when I take the switch out to clean it, I'm going to uh, pull the wafers out and take a, a really good look at it. Um, I'll probably be able to solder this back in if I need to, but uh, I, I, like I said, I don't see any place where it uh, fell off. So I will take another look when I get to that point. But uh, yeah, it's going to need quite a bit of work. You can see just how dirty the uh, switches are. So I'm going to throw this in the ultrasonic cleaner, clean that up, and then uh, repopulate this board with new components. Open this pot up and clean that, as well as these two switches. Just the same basic uh, rework I usually do. And then after that, it's just these two switches right here. So let's get to it. So take a look how clean the circuit board is after about 60 seconds in the uh, ultrasonic cleaner there. Looks like brand new. Spotless. No more grease and dirt. So that saves uh, quite a bit of time, you know, physically cleaning versus just taking it out and dunking it right in. Alright, I'm going to get to uh, replacing the components on this board and I'll be back. So here's the uh, circuit board all set to go. I pulled this out of the ultrasonic cleaner a little while ago and I just uh, repopulated the board with new components. Have them all stood off evenly. I uh, serviced the pot and the switch here, and this switch I actually soldered all of these uh, rivet connections down. These arms that reach out and contact the wafer here are uh, originally only riveted to the circuit board. You can see the holes here in the spaces that don't have the arms. And over time that rivet gets loose and the connection between the arm and the uh, trace on the circuit board actually becomes oxidized and the connection eventually fails. So one of the things to do is you solder the arms to the circuit board which will provide a much better connection and won't fail over time. After I did that, I uh, serviced all the connections with deoxit D100L and I re-greased the ball bearing here so now the, uh, the action is nice and smooth. So on the circuit board, the only thing left to do is to uh, service this switch right here, which I'll do next. I'll show on camera and then uh, reinstall it into the amp. But uh, yeah, this board came out pretty nice. And uh, I think this is the last circuit board I had to do. So I'll come back when I uh, service this switch and I'll show you how I do it. Okay, I'm just working on the uh, front switches for the front panel of the amp. I have this set right here all set to go. I just pulled this apart and cleaned and lubed it. So I'm about ready to install this. I have uh, this switch removed from its holder here, and I had this torn apart, and I just cleaned it up, got it back together. So before I install this, I'm going to pull this one out. Figured I'd show this on camera for anybody curious. But uh, it's pretty easy to take these apart. There is a very, very small spring that's held down. You're going to want to hold this. 
This is a, basically a retaining clip and it holds this bar in place. I'll show it to you. This is the, uh, the bar that locks the switch in place as you press each down. As you press one, it, it pushes the bar and it engages. But, uh, it's a little tedious and you can really only ever do this one time because these tangs right here that hold the switch into place can break over time as you take them out. You don't really need to remove the switch from the bracket, but I'm going to be putting this bracket in the ultrasonic cleaner. So I'm going to remove the switch entirely. So pull that clip out. And then we can pull the switch out from the back. And you can see the contacts. The contacts on the, uh, on the switch pole itself are gold plated. So they're in really good condition. But if you look on the inside, don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but the contacts are a little bit grimy. So I'm going to keep working at this, get this pulled out. I'm going to uh, take this switch off, um, off the camera and then I'll clean this and put it back together and I'll be back when I get to this point right here. Okay, I'm back. I just got this uh, pulled out of the ultrasonic cleaner and I have the uh, switch back into place. So what I like to do after I take it out of the ultrasonic cleaner is um, I use some contact cleaner and a uh, little pipe cleaner. And I just clean the contacts. Just like that. And then I'll uh, spray the excess out. And then I'll apply some uh, Deoxy D100L to the contacts. So now that I have the uh, contacts cleaned up, all I'm going to do now is feed the, uh, the pull piece here, the actual switch mechanism, back in through the front and make sure the, uh, the fingers are lined up, otherwise they'll fetch as they go in. They should just go in easily with no problem. Now we're going to take the spring. This is the tricky part, this might take me a second to do. You have to feed the spring down over and you have to hold tension on it. It's already hard enough as is without a camera here. And then feet, put the clip down through the top. Release the spring and then you're all set. Just make sure the spring actually goes over that tang there. And now we're all set. Now what I like to do after I just dunk this in the ultrasonic, I'm just gonna add a little bit of oil to the mechanism here, this little push bar. Now all that's left to do is to uh, Put this other switch down into place. Make sure it actually goes down all the way. Now this is where the uh, retaining clips uh, come into play. So you can see the push bar sticking out right through here. And this is where the retaining clip goes. So you want to take the retaining clip very carefully and feed the uh, top down through these two top tangs here and kind of push it down into place. Now 
just like that. So you can see the tang on the inside right there. That's what holds the bar into place. And these two ears fold down over the top, which is what I'll do right now. Just like that. So now that bar is engaged, the switch now functions. You can kind of see how it works down here. As one switch is pushed in, the bar holds it in with the uh, detents on the switch itself. And as the other one is pushed, it pushes the bar that way against the spring, releases that one, and engages on that one. It's a simple mechanism, but if you lose that uh, tension bar right there, you're kind of screwed. So I'm going to get this in, and uh, I'll come back when I have it uh, assembled. Okay, I'm back with the 8550. I got the uh, amplifier assembled pretty much all the way, and I realized I uh, wasn't taking video. So I'll just walk you through what I did. I got the wooden side panels installed, um, as well as the two amp modules, the power supply, and the front board, which is what I was working on uh, when I took that last video. So uh, that's all in. All the controls and switches are in and secured. They're all working uh, really well. Everything's nice and smooth. But uh, so I got that all done. I got the components swapped between the two faceplates. So all the, the nicer, like the back plate and the plexiglass window here, that's uh, swapped over to the better faceplate that has less scratches on it. So that looks pretty good. Cleaned up really well. You can see I have a new LED indicator in the power button there as the uh, original grain of wheat bulb was burned out. I also have a proper dropping resistor in series with that. But uh, yeah, it, it really came together. You can see the wiring uh, loom inside that I did. Clean that up. Then I have the, uh, the wire terminals installed on the two amp boards and the power supply. That was kind of a pain in the ass to do. Sony used some really cheap wiring in this amp and uh, it just makes servicing kind of a nightmare. So removing those old connectors and putting these in is the, the best way to go, I think. So here's the, uh, the old connectors I removed. I removed the, uh, the notoriously bad push-on connectors that are the cause of a lot of VFET failures. But what a lot of people don't talk about are these, uh, these small pin connectors here. These sit on the, uh, the boards and they supply critical voltages uh, as well as ground connection and your speaker outputs. And uh, when I got this amplifier set up, I was chasing a, a really bad distortion problem on one channel. Uh, one channel I had like 0.02% THD, and on the opposite channel I had like somewhere around 0.1%, 0.2%. And so I did some probing in the circuit, and I found that my fault lied in these connectors here. Let me pull one connector out and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So you can see this connector right here is just one of a few that had this issue. But you can see the stranded wires are starting to fray and come out of this connector. And uh, so it was with one of the speaker connectors on the, uh, this amp board right here. Um, the speaker wire actually pulled out of the crimp itself. And uh, that's where my distortion was coming from. It was only holding on with uh, a couple of strands of wire. So as soon as I removed these and I uh, directly soldered the wires into the actual uh, header pins down there. Don't know how well you'd be able to see that. Um, I did that on both channels, as well as the, the couple pins that are down there on the power supply. Um, because all of these seem to be faulty. The crimps just aren't good enough and they don't hold up over time. So if you have one of these amps that you're working on, I really, really suggest removing these and uh, just directly soldering or using turret terminals or something along those lines that are just better than these uh, crimps because these are these are terrible. Um, nobody really talks about these, but uh, they're really bad. I also want to mention the fact that I also replaced the ring terminals that were uh, originally on the filter capacitors. I had two wires pull out with very light force of these connectors. So what I did was I uh, used some high quality AN 
uh, standard ring terminals here, and I directly solder the wires to those, and I use some heat shrink on them. Um, that is going to offer a much lower uh, resistance connection to these uh, really critical voltages here, as well as your ground. So you can see the offset is sitting pretty nicely. It's, uh, it, it's going to drift around as the ambient temperature um, changes and as airflow goes over the amp. I mean, even me standing near this amp causes it to fluctuate a bit. So when the lid's on, it's going to be much better. Um, same can be said about the bias voltage in both channels. That will change as the line voltage changes and as these VFETs heat up and cool off. The uh, original Sony service manual calls out a bias voltage of about 125 millivolts. So I lowered that to about 100 just to be a little bit more conservative and just to run these VFETs a little bit cooler at idle. And when we get to the uh, distortion measurements, you'll see that uh, this amplifier is, is beating spec uh, in every way. Yeah, it's the same with uh, power output. It's really conservatively rated from Sony. So you'll see that in just a second here. And just a recap, here's all the old parts I've replaced. I have them uh, individually bagged for each board. There's a selector board on the front, the input board. Here's the two amp boards here. Tons of parts. Here's the old mic insulators that I took out. The power supply board, you can see the old rectifiers, filters, tons of stuff. And here's the old connectors. Um, I'm going to say this again, if you have these connectors in your amp, take them out, get rid of them. The push-on style uh, Molex connectors here, these really terrible quality crimps for the, uh, for the power supply main filter caps, as well as these push-on like header pins here. They're all terrible. Sony really dropped the ball when it comes to the, uh, the parts quality in these amps, uh, especially when it comes to the wiring and the connectors. So get these out of your amps. Save yourself a headache. But uh, anyway, back to the old parts. Tons of stuff, tons of stuff removed. The uh, speaker terminals, got those out, as well as the uh, filter cap. Funnily enough, this actually still measures within spec uh, in terms of leakage, ESR, and capacitance. But uh, with something as critical as uh, VFETs here, you don't want to take a chance. I mean, this works now, but who's to say this is going to work uh, for the next 10, 20 years? So I'll be back with some distortion measurements, and we'll go from there. Okay, so I just got my uh, distortion uh, test set hooked up. I have an AA501 and a SG505 here. The SG505 is feeding a ultra-low distortion into the input of the 8550. And then I have the output of the 8550 loaded down to 8 ohms on each channel. And I'm uh, feeding one of the outputs, uh, I think on the left channel, into the AA501. So if we look at the uh, RMS level that this is outputting right now into 8 ohms, we're sitting at about 3 volts RMS. And at 3 volts, that's uh, roughly equal to 1 watt. And we're seeing a distortion level of 0.02%, which is uh, way under spec. Uh, Sony actually specs this out at 1 watt at 0.05%. Uh, they don't talk about whether or not they're A-weighting, so if we add some A-weighting here, we'll see that it, it drops down even further. We're sitting at 0.0059%, uh, and that's equal on both channels at 1 watt. So uh, we're going to go up to 10 watts now, and that's uh, about 9 volts RMS. So we'll see here. I'll increase the amplitude. We'll go up to 9 volts. So there's about 9 volts right there, which is about 10 watts. And you can see our THD is even lower. Uh, using no A weighting, our THD is sitting at 0.008%. If we add A weighting, it's 0.004%. So that's awesome. That's uh, way under spec. And you can see the uh, channel tracking is even on both channels. So let's go up to uh, 50 watts, which is about 20 volts. So there's about 20 volts right there. And uh, our THD is 0.007% basically. Using A weighting, it's uh, 0.005. And that's about 50 watts right there which is really, really good. It's a really good distortion number. So let's go up to 100 watts, which is uh, roughly 
Now this is pushing the, uh, the stated limits of the amplifier. Which is about 110 watts. So that's about 100 watts right there. We can see our THD is 0.007%. And uh, at rated power, the specification is 0.1%. So that's sitting massively, massively under the, uh, the rated THD. And I can go even further here. Let's go up to uh, 33 volts, which is about 100 and, what is it? 136 watts per channel. And now we're starting to get the, the specified numbers for THD that the uh, Sony manual states. So this thing outputs 136 watts before it meets the uh, THD spec. So let me sp let's bring that down. Uh, before I bring it down, I want to show the clipping point of each channel is perfectly even. Both channels, top and bottom, are perfect. So this thing is uh, it's working really well. So I'm going to bring that down. Don't want to cook my load, uh, my resistor loads. So this thing is working much better than spec. So that, uh, that just goes to show a restoration like this is more than just reliability uh, I mean, improvement. It's, it's all about performance as well. So now that we know this thing is uh, measuring really well, we're going to get it uh, hooked up into the system, and we'll go from there. But I'm super happy with this thing so far. It's been a huge project. It's taken months and months and months for me to do, only because I don't have a lot of time to allocate to uh, projects like this. So when I'm finally able to uh, finish uh, a job like this, it's, uh, it just feels really good. So with that all said, I'm going to uh, get the lid on and uh, hook it up into the system. Real quick, I just want to illustrate the final product of uh, doing a good job cleaning controls on an amplifier like this. So these are your signal switching um, selectors here, as well as your gain for each channel. And uh, you can see the, as I change the gain, there's no channel dropout, there's no noise or static. And you can see just how even the two channels are with each other. If I switch the inputs here, you can see there's no noise. If I wiggle the switch, you can see that it doesn't drop out. So pulling switches apart like that and really making sure they're clean instead of just spraying some deoxid in there and, you know, moving it back and forth a few times. Uh, it really shows these, uh, these pots are going to last another 50 years or so with no issue. So just want to illustrate that real quick. Some people might have wondered uh, why I went through the effort of doing that the way I did. But uh, yeah, now you see why. All right, so I have them both installed into the system. I've got the top lid put on the 8550, and I have the 8450 put on top. I forgot to show the, uh, the rear of the lid here is all cleaned up. Uh, there's a couple of blemishes, but uh, it's much better than what it was. And in this case, I think the owner actually has uh, another lid he's going to install on this thing. I mean, this thing really deserves it, so. Um, in this uh, situation, I have the 8450 put on top of the 8550. Um, normally, you wouldn't want to do this as the 8550 runs quite hot. So uh, in normal uses, um, you don't want to stack anything on top of the 8550. But uh, just for now, it's not going to harm it. But you can see how good these things are together. They look so good. And they sound amazing too. They're really a great complement to one another in terms of sonics. And aesthetics as well, obviously. All the controls on the preamp and the power amp are all noiseless, very smooth. Everything works really well. And the meters are just eye candy. They're super cool to look at. But yeah, all the uh, rear I.O. came out really well too. 
that all looks really good. So I'm gonna end the video here. Um, thanks to everybody for watching this uh, this long process. It's been way too long, actually. Should have had these done a while ago, but uh, I'm thankful that the owner of these is very patient, and uh, he allowed me to do the best that I could do in the in the time that I had. So, as always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to uh, like, subscribe, and uh, comment. I always like to read your guys' comments, um, even though it might take me a while to uh, get back to you guys. Um, it's still awesome to to read through all the support that I get, and uh, even the criticism. Um, I enjoy. Um, reading comments that you know criticize my work it makes me want to do better um so uh yeah anyway i'll see you guys in the next one